All right, uh, thank you very much. And do you mind if I just walk closer to my slides because I feel more secure standing here. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much to come into the talk. And this is joint work with uh, Andrew Amen and Nick Warmold from Monash University. Um, the focus of the talk is to talk about the fast algorithm, even though I'll try to speak slowly, even though maybe it's not a good strategy to talk in uh, Fox, you know, yeah, you know why. Okay, um, so, so different from the previous talk, this talk, I expect everything is very simple, including the problem description. So the problem is as follows, I'm giving you a set of vertices, and I specify the degrees on every vertex. And I want you to amount the old vertex, oh, sorry, all the graphs, simple graphs, with the specified degrees, uniformly at random output one. So that's the question. Um, and I didn't invent this problem. It has a long history of research. And the earliest research I can trace back is by Tinhofer in 1979. He proposed this problem. And I think he was studying regular graphs. And degrees are pretty small, like three or five. Um, but he didn't really, you know, pro uh, he had some kind of proposal and some, some experimental algorithms without any the theoretical analysis or guaranteeing. Uh, but if at that time someone point to him the paper in mathematics uh, by Ben and Canfield that was published a year earlier, he could find a solution there. So the paper there uh, is nothing about algorithm or sampling. It's simply enumeration of graphs with given degrees. Um, when degrees are pretty small, but if the, the proof naturally gives an algorithm, which I just call the rejection algorithm, even though it didn't really exist in literature, and two years later, Bolabos used uh, basically the same proof and extended a little bit further so the degrees can grow uh, a bit, I mean, quite slowly with regarding to the number of vertices. Roughly speaking, um, the maximum degree can be allowed to be square root of log of n. And the first, really the first time an algorithm start to appear about you know, with guaranteeing performance for such problem was by uh, Jeremy Sinclair, 1990. And at the same time, uh, McKay and Wormald at the same year, they used completely different approach. So I put them into two slides. So back here, the method Jeremy Sinclair used, of course, is uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Uh, and, and basically start from a larger space, uh, the graphs they allow to modify the degree of two vertices, and then they um, study some kind of Markov chain on that space, and they show uh, fast mixing. Um, the mixing time is polynomial n and uh, polynomial in log of one of epsilon, and epsilon is the tolerance um, error. And then somehow uh, later on, um, people start to feel that they, it's nicer to actually work on the Markov chain on the same state of you know, the, the state that you want to sample rather than a bigger state. Because in, in the paper by Jeremy Sinclair, the types of um, degree sequence you can handle is called so-called the p-stable uh, degree sequence, which is not really easy to, ha uh, to, to actually verify a degree sequence or family of degree sequences p-stable. It, it, it relies on some kind of enumeration result. So a bunch of paper uh, study another uh, Markov chain based on switch chain. So they probably get some kind of intuition from the other work over here, which also appear around 90. But anyway, I put it there because uh, it's still a Markov chain on color method. And you will see uh, from here, they started to give actually uh, a an explicit bound on the mixing time, which is quite high, right? Um, for practical use, you, you wouldn't run so long when you have a million vertices. Um, and uh, the work started like first paper is bipartite, and then a regular, and then here's a regular general graph, and then Greenhill uh, improved some counting lemma in the paper, and then they, she was able to show it for irregular degrees, but still the degrees wouldn't, you, you have some constraint there, um, and probably the constraint is stronger than the constraint for P stability in Jeremy Sinclair's paper. And then recently there are two more groups trying to study the same switch chain and then relates the kind of degree sequence for which the switch chain mixing, mixes fast with this p-stable uh, degree class and show the relation between them. And uh, the other 
uh, line of research. Yeah, start from McCann Walmart, as I said. So it also is a Markov chain-based algorithm, but it's not Monte Carlo, it's actually Las Vegas algorithm. And you will see that the runtime, of course, Las Vegas, if we will talk about expected runtime, it's much faster. Uh, but even though the degree sequence that you can handle is much more restrictive. So the first paper handles, um, uh, let's just say the regular graph where D is only up to N to the one over three and the runtime is uh, D cube N. Uh, and, and it can easily generalize to a non-regular non case, but again, the maximum degree wouldn't be too big. And, uh, and since then, there was no progress on this for a long time. This is exactly uniform distribution. But then using the switching method or some ideas from there, people started to study um, approximate uh, version using the switching method. They're even faster. Most of them subquadratic and some are linear time. And again, the D can't be too large, uh, typically bounds by square root of N. Um, and then a few years uh, before myself, together with Swarmold, we uh, adding more ingredients, and then we basically we, we can make switching method to work for the up to square root n. And the switching method typically works for degrees that are nice enough, like not too far from degree sequence, or from regular degree sequence, but we also make it work for heavily tailed degree sequences, such as power law degree sequences. So that's the bit of. Uh, literature review, and um, besides those uh, two, two, two research lines, there are also other ways to generate, degree, uh, generate random graphs with given degree sequence. One is uh, sequential importance sampling. Um, they, they don't generate uniformly, but you can use the statistics there to say something about the uniform model. And the research there is basically you want to know how many samples are necessary in order to say something about the uniform model. And the um, uh, uh, algorithm is given by Blistan and Diaconis. There are positive results showing that you know the one degree sequence is nice enough. Only polynomial number of samples is needed. Po negative examples are also given. Later, um, when the degree sequence is not so nice, then you need exponential number of samples. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through um, the rejection algorithm and Wormel sorry, mckay wormholz algorithm, and I show how they work. So rejection algorithm is, is, uh, is, is the following. So represent every vertex as a bin, okay? And in each bin, you put a set of points there where the number points match the degree, okay? Now you take a perfect matching, uniformly at random, over those points. Represent each pair as an edge, and then naturally you get a random possibly multi-graph, but with desired degree distribution. And if, if you're lucky that you get a simple graph, you can prove that the distribution is exactly uniform. And then you just accept an output. Of course, the probability of being simple is not that large. When the degree becomes you know, more than square root of log n, um, the number of iterations or the number of times you have to sample becomes super polynomial. And that's why Bolobosch algorithm, I call it algorithm, he didn't give the algorithm, but uh, that algorithm would fail. So what's new in McKay and Wormholtz algorithm is that you don't just do rejection uh, when you create multi-graph, instead you try to do some switches to switch away the multi-edges. So in your graph you may have a double edge, let's say, take another two <coughs> edges simple from the graph, and then you do the switches like this. Okay, remove those edges, add those to, uh, four new edges. This operation doesn't change the degree sequence, so you're still in your, in your sample space, and it removes the double edge, right? And the algorithm just keep doing like this until you get a simple graph. So here you get SI is the uh, graphs that has I double edges, and you keep removing the double edges until you become simple, and then you output. Well, of course, one natural question is, oh, we can do that, but it's still uniformly distributed when you output. And it's not going to be. There is some kind of distortion, and it's easy to see why. So you start from a graph, let's say G, and then when you do this switching, you result in a graph G prime. You count the number of ways you can do this switching. So that's F of G, and the given starting from G prime, you count the number of ways you can, you can switch back, right? So you basically create a multi, uh, sorry, a bipartite graph here, where here's all the graphs with i double edges, and here's all the graphs with i minus one double edges. 
And the out degree here is just the number of ways you can do the switching. And the incoming degree here, BG prime, is just the number of ways you can switch into a G prime. If you're lucky, which won't happen, that the graph is very regular, then of course, very simply, you can show that it's uh, uniform. Once you start uniform here, you get uniform here. Of course, it's not uniform, but if you can compute those f and b functions, then you can correct it. You can correct the distortion by performing this kind of uh, Markov chain, right? Um, An easy way, let's see from this side, it's a little easier to see. So assume all the com incoming edge probabilities are the same, and I'm at, I'm, I'm at graph G prime. If I know that all the other graphs in this, in this um, space here receives, let's say, at least 100 incoming, and I see myself receiving 120, what do I do? I just reject 20, leaving only keeping 100, and I do it for everything, and, and then I get uniform distribution, right? This is intuition, but you can tune it to make a rigorous proof. But important message here is uh, rejection scheme is necessary, and in order to do this, you have to compute the degree here, which is number of ways you can you can perform or you can you can perform a switching. So that explains the time complexity d cube n here. Okay, so how many ways I can perform a switching? I have to choose two two paths where they have some kind of constraints here. There, there is no edge between them, and using a brute force, you know, stupid search, you just go through all the pairs of, of, of double edges, you, you get this complexity, right? But you can do better. Um, so how do, you do, how do you do D cube N? You just go through all the, oh, let's consider the, oh, sorry, first use inclusion exclusion, so you count how many, you know, number of pairs of two paths and then subtracting the forbidden cases. Let's say one of the forbidden cases, there's one edge here and then there's one edge here because five paths, again, is easy to count. This is a regular case. So assume I want to know how many six cycles are there in the graph. Uh, I just go through all the three paths, okay? So D cube N, I can go through all the three paths, and I use proper data structure to encode between any two vertices how many three paths are there. So once I know those information, when I go through a three paths, going from this vertex to that vertex, and I, use, I know already the information, how many other three paths are there between those two vertices, I can compute the number of six cycles. Well, th this, this, this analysis wouldn't be very fun to, to actually code because there are quite many you know, intersections and exclusions, um, but in the original paper, they go through like 10,000 cases, but it's a, it's a quite stupid proof because they just want to get a proof. Um, later on, we actually sorted out that you only need, you know, by better characterization, you only need uh, maybe 11, 12 cases. But still, it's not very fun to, to actually code. We hi hired some uh, postdoc, but the postdoc has to be good at both mathematics and, and uh, coding, and it was very hard to get the right counting argument in the end. All right, so that's the old algorithm. Um, this is our new result. We improved to linear time, and so still it's an exact uniform sampler, and this is the same condition as the mckay wormholtz paper. Uh, as I said before, if you want to get uniform sampler, it seems necessary, you have to know the exact number of ways to perform it. And if you want to know exact way to perform it, the D cube N is the best you can do. All right. So how can you do this? Well. So I didn't explain this. So basically, as I said, I, I know a little bit of you know, information of how the degrees of all the other guys, and I know my own, own degree, and I can do some kind of correction. So basically, it's by rejection. You have to do one, one side and also other the B side. I don't want to explain here. So which basically, F rejection is you can do a right rejection with this probability, even though that's not exactly what the algorithm tries to do, because that means I have to also count you know, f of g. But the algorithm actually can perform equivalently as this probability without computing f of g, okay? So this is the part you can't avoid. I have to compute the number of incoming degrees, and that calls q d cube m. The new algorithm is that we are going to use a different rejection scheme and that's, that rejection depends on the switching where you switch G into G prime. 
Remember, in the previous rejection, you just look at the G prime, I just count how many ways I can switch in. I don't care if you are switching into me from G or some other, other graphs, it's the same. Okay, so the, new, the idea is really trying to view um, the switching from a different perspective. Um, so a switching, now if I want to see how to represent this switching from G to G prime, Basically, I'll give you a graph G prime here, and I also specify particularly those four pairs, five pair to one, three pi to seven, six pi to two, four pi, four pi pair to eight. So I give you G and these four pairs that uniquely specifies a switching, right? Because I know that once those pairs are specified, I know which G this is. So that's the first step, just uh, another interpretation of the switching. So now I would view this switching as G prime. C1, C2 are constraints. C1 says, C1 says, okay, I must have those two pairs existing. Five is paired to one, three is paired to seven. And C2 says, additional to C1, I must have six paired to two, four paired to eight. Okay? All right, oh, too fast. And now, previously, so the algorithm, without any reject, uh, B rejection part, it generates this constrained G prime uniformly at random. And what mckay wormos algorithm do from this perspective is that they try to, um, once, you can con once you can generate those objects uniformly, they try to generate an unconstrained G prime uniformly by counting how many ways I can put those constraints simultaneously, right? And what we do differently in this paper is we relax those constraints once a time, not simultaneously. And that significantly reduces the computation time. All right, so a bit more specifically how you do this. Um, um, I just simplify some notation. So this purple B is a, is a number that you have to compute. It's a number of ways, giving you graph G prime, how many ways I can choose a two path where well, those don't contend in any multiple edges. It's very simple. It's actually D times D minus one times N. And then you, you do some, uh, you exclude the number of two paths that contend in the double edge, which is very easy to compute. The, the green B, says that once I'm giving you this one, three, one, five, three, seven, that are indicated by my switching S, how many ways I can choose these two paths such that those two choices, couple of choices together, induces a valid switching. The choice here doesn't have to agree with S, but the first pair agrees with S. So that's my green B, and I can easily specify some parameters that are lower bounds of those two quantities. And the rejection probability is simply this thing, the lower bound divided by the true value. So one thing to note here is these values are very easy to compute. Once you, for instance, if you know those, how many ways can I choose a two paths that there's no edge here, no edge here? You, if you just do brute force search, it's d cubed, right? But you can do better, d, d squared time is enough. And then there are d squared total number of iterations. When you multiply them together, you get this time. Uh, complexity. And I don't think I have time to, yes, sorry, so, so I'm not going to go through the proof, even though the proof is simple, very, very simple, you just write down the probability of G prime, and then you see everything cancels, and then you get a, you get a constant term. And um, anyway, so what I want to say is, uh, there are, previously there are a bunch of algorithms that, that are used, switching method based, and they use the old switching, uh, sorry, old rejection scheme. You just replace by the new rejection scheme. You, in, you, you just improve the running time of all of them. Um, in principle, for instance, the um, power law case, the previous result was about n to the fourth, and then you get to linear time now. And uh, I think I should say something about open uh, problem. Um, I didn't prepare in my slides. Um, so um, you can't do faster now but you can try to make D larger. So D up to square root of N is still the threshold. We, we, we tried very hard, we couldn't do it. And if anyone can do it, I'll be very happy. Thank you.